this is the life. I wonder if that's a bit too loud. Okay, so this is four reasons why I decided to put a Tesla Model 3 battery on my house. I've been looking forward to making this video for so long, but I felt like I just needed to get the project finished, or at least to a point where I can say I've actually done it before I shared this with you. Now, I'm probably gonna save my biggest reason to the end, of course. If you've not been watching, I decided to go to all the effort to learn how to and actually put a Tesla Model 3 battery on the house for home energy storage. And I'm gonna get into why in this video. Some of it will be obvious and some of it not so much. Hmm. <laughs> Connections across the capacitor. I'm expecting around 350 volts, let's see. Oh. 355 volts. We've only gone and done it. Yes! <laughs> so, let's get straight into it the price of energy storage. The price you pay for an EV battery per kilowatt compared to a commercial battery is significantly cheaper. Like, a massive difference. Where you find a huge cost saving, you're always gonna find people that want to find a way to make it work. Of course, you've got to account for your time and the potential risk of a bad battery. Most of the batteries that you'd source from an EV right now in 2025 come from crash damaged vehicles. Sometimes the vehicle could have been in a flood with no visible signs of damage unless you know it had been in a flood. And if you didn't check the cell voltages, you potentially could be caught out. Other times the damage could be obvious. Maybe the casing has some damage and a number of cells may be clearly damaged or other packs just receive no physical damage but have worrying signs internally. I touched on this a little bit in a previous video on the importance of checking the battery that you might purchase by reading the cell data and then using the battery emulator or purchasing from a trusted source. But given those risks, still the price per kilowatt is dramatically cheaper than an off-the-shelf battery. And for me, knowing that I have a half-decent pack, I was willing to take that risk. Battery storage gives you and I the ability to reduce our energy bills by storing energy or filling a battery with cheap off-peak electricity. Or, like me, you could even sell it back for profit. I have a few solar installations on my property and I've steadily brought my gas and electric bill down, but I've still been receiving a bill in winter for using heating and with solar performance being diminished. My curiosity in being able to turn that into a negative all year round has been one of the reasons why I did this. Even if it did come with an upfront investment, let's call that part B of reason one. Financial benefit, monies, wonga, cash. Excluding time, we're actually looking at about a four year payback. Tell me where you can make that sort of returns on something that aids the grid and gives you the option of energy security, hey? the DIY route. I built a number of battery packs over the years, ranging from 18650s from used laptop batteries through to LFP cells purchased from Alibaba. Given lithium iron phosphate's relative safety and less chance of thermal issues and its increased cycle life along with avoiding cobalt and generally less environmentally impacting, LFP was a natural progression. The cells are easier to work with Spot welding 318 650 cells takes time. Spot welding each positive with a fuse wire takes longer, trust me. Now I'm by no means the first person to use an EV battery pack for home energy storage or off-grid energy storage. A long time ago this was originally done by breaking packs apart from the Nissan Leaf packs or the original Tesla Model S packs. Back in the day I was dying for one of those Model S 24 volt bricks but I just couldn't justify the price. It's amazing how batteries have come on in the last 10 years, wow. But doing this, breaking down an EV pack 
loses so many of the advantages of an EV pack. A complete system with a battery management system and a protective casing. All self-secured and connected professionally, plus the advantage of 400 volts. It was only a couple of years ago that I learned that there's an entire market of high voltage, 150 to 800 volt hybrid solar inverters, generally not used in domestic settings. Most home energy storage is around the 50 volts mark, which does increase cable sizing, as higher current is needed for any kilowatt increase. 400 volts means less losses. With smaller low voltage packs, you become restricted on the kilowatt output due to the massive current and massive cables. Now, take for example my Give Energy 3.6 kilowatt output battery pack. The cables on that are thicker than the 10 millimeter square cross-sectional cables that connect to the Tesla battery pack. Yet the Tesla battery pack outputs 17 kilowatts. A few things have made all of this possible for the DIYers working with electricians. For example, a larger range of battery pack options with many manufacturers bringing out EVs. Commercial software has come about which is able to control EV batteries for the commercial market or open source software for the DIYer. Really the second one is the only one for me. And then along with that is the DBC file. These are like the interpreters of the battery pack data. Much of the communication protocols between all of these EV batteries has been deciphered by nerdy clever people, which means that you can read the CAN messages that are being sent and received from the battery to tell you the state of charge, the voltage of a particular cell, and many other data points. This is how I've been able to communicate with the commercial inverter using the battery emulator and providing all the information to the inverter or to the battery which it needs to run safely, as if it was connected to a battery that Fox ESS themselves have produced. DIY poses an opportunity to learn and have fun along the way. Now to me, if you're going to be building 400 volt DIY battery packs, you have got balls of steel to be messing with that level of voltage. And DIY changes the cost from a, nah, it can't be done, to, okay, we'll make this happen. That brings me on to the electrician inside me. If you speak to different electricians and say, I'm going to connect an EV battery to a solar inverter, there's quite a few that might get uncomfortable and potentially not want to carry out the initial verification and testing, or the equivalent or whatever that is in your country. This is something which new circuits have to go through to prove that they are up to standard. But when you break it down, in the UK, at least, our big book, BS7671, with all the guidance for electricians, it doesn't exactly say that you can't use EV batteries for home energy storage. The section for prosumer is actually quite small and there's a lot that applies within the big book to this sort of installation. Correct cable sizing, correct breaker selection, correct signage, isolation of batteries. All of the touchy bits need to be behind covers, IP ratings, earthing and so on. But, and it's a big but, there is no you shouldn't do this. In fact, the guidance we've seen on home energy storage specifically excludes EV batteries. Also, the government has carried out trials and produced a study regarding the second life use of EV batteries. And it all seems up in the air. So, like a 1970s F1 team with their fan cars and six-wheeled machines, I'm going to get my install in before restrictive regulations come into force. Mm. Generally, the way it works in the UK is the UK doesn't make new electrical regulations until someone gets hurt or worse. So don't copy me, all right? But I do actually want somebody to copy me, which brings me on to my final reason. The bigger picture. How many EVs are written off each year? It's really hard to find that data. I mean, it is there, it's behind a paywall and this video didn't have the budget for that. But according to CAP HPI, 0.9% of EVs under five years old are written off each year in the UK. So with 1.25 million EVs in the UK alone, a country where EV sales have slowed down compared to other countries, that puts us at around 11,000 EVs say half of them have batteries that are in great condition, ones that are not in a flood and not sustain physical damage, and that would leave us with about 5,500. Let's deduct another thousand on to air on the side of caution. 
Now that gives us 4,500 EV batteries that are sitting around waiting for cars that need a battery replacement. Data again shows that EV batteries are very reliable and tend to last for the entire life of the vehicle with useful capacity even after the vehicle has died its natural death. So, where are all these EV packs going to go? Well, not into warranty cars. Manufacturers do not use crash damage packs. They use new or in-house reconditioned packs. And if they do manage to wriggle out of warranty claims, they manage to charge their customers extortionate prices for new ones. Let's say you brought yourself a Jaguar Land Rover I-Pace and under recall, JLR brought it back to replace the battery due to an overheating issue. They won't be using one of these written off packs. The only real market for used EV packs is the mechanic or the mechanically minded person who's looking for a bargain to put a damaged vehicle back together. One that's out of warranty or EV conversions. Now you do get the use case of a potential vehicle that's out of warranty, say an 8, 10, 12 year old vehicle where the owner wants to put in a fresh, refreshed or upgraded battery. A lot of this seemed to happen with the Nissan Leafs. But packs have come on a long way since those days of Nissan Leafs. Let's take my Tesla Model 3 pack, a pack that was made in 2022 and I purchased it in 2023. Is that just going to sit around till all the Model 3s with batteries that are out of warranty, eight or 10 years old, waiting to find a home? Maybe, but given that there's hundreds of batteries lying around in different places, you can start to see that the market just isn't there for them at the minute, at least not in vehicles. And this is where home energy storage comes in, a second life for a pack with plenty of useful capacity, something which the UK government has acknowledged that it could be an option. Studies have been carried out with Nissan Leaf packs being used in a container-based solution for second life storage and the same sort of thing has been done by JLR that I mentioned before. But at this stage I really believe that it's a buyer's market for EV packs with larger quantities which is only going to get larger as more and more vehicles end up on our roads and more of those vehicles are written off. These packs which are too good to destroy in my view. We estimated earlier 11,000 vehicles written off a year in the UK. We estimated that 4,500 would have good battery packs, which leaves 6,500 packs that couldn't be recycled. Now that is a lot of recycled packs for one mediocre sized country. When we start looking at how many EVs China are pumping out, companies like Redwood Materials are working with EV manufacturers to recycle the packs to their core materials. Given the sheer numbers and the fact that these battery packs from good vehicles can go for many years to come in the home energy storage environment, to me it seems sensible to find a second life use for as many of them as possible. Now to me this just highlights the need to reuse rather than recycle. Now I'm not a full greeny tree hugging man, I'm actually a man who likes to collect things that I think will be useful one day. So it pains me if we waste the second life home or grid energy storage opportunity that EVs will offer us. But we did say it's a challenge to know if these packs are safe to be used for the second life setting. How can this happen? Well, I'd like to see a more regulated EV battery reselling where batteries have to remain somebody's responsibility given their value to the energy transition. Batteries requiring a standardised checklist to be ticked off when they come out of vehicles, with those found to have issues not being sold as completely ready to use packs. This sort of stuff does happen. I've met one seller who tried to sell me a dodgy scraped up battery that wasn't even the pack that I paid for. It was a different chemistry. If you look at that, look at the part number that is a different now, he either didn't know about batteries thinking that all Teslas come with the interchangeable batteries or he was just dodgy. I'll let you decide. And I know I'm not alone with this. Perhaps every used EV pack sold should come with a full report, something linked to the VIN number something that can't just be made up and perhaps has to remain with the EV manufacturer on a database.
but realistically this just isn't going to happen. Testing and triage is not easy. When each manufacturer has a different way and they do not share the tools needed to test their batteries. This would need consistency across all nations too. Yeah. Oh, and someone's gonna have to take the fall when that one time happens when something goes wrong. Mm. Now imagine a world where multiple EV packs from the same manufacturer are put into containers that contain thermal management, fire suppression systems, among other controls and monitor systems to help in grid balancing and filling in where the renewables are not so abundant or demand outstrips supply, helping to avoid the costly gas or coal power stations being turned on. But you know, I genuinely don't see a future of these batteries being in people's homes. They're just too big and bulky to move around. Heck, if you've got the land, it can work. So while I wouldn't recommend designing one of these to look like a Tesla Powerwall and installing it on the side of your own house, I have done this to show what can be done and what should be done in the future. And let's face it, if some DIYer slash electrician can power his entire house and buy himself on the grid with an EV battery, why can't it be implemented to cover our grid battery needs? That is the Tesla Powerwall that Tesla didn't make. We've done it. Yes. Look at that. Now I'm saying this, despite knowing that there are some elements of risk. When I had a TikTok video about the installation on my house do really well, the driving comment was about battery fires. We've kind of touched on this already, but with good testing of the EV packs, following the electrical code or regulations in your area, and using a system that maintains the BMS and a system to manage the battery and inverter communication, the risks are dramatically reduced. And let's face it, everything in life has a risk. EV packs are coming out with a range of chemistries and this chemistry mix is continually advancing. We're seeing more LFP batteries being put into electric vehicles. While not as energy dense, they are less volatile and have a greater ability to handle more cycles. In an energy storage situation, 5,000 cycles should be easy for a battery like this. And for me, this is the final way to make EV battery packs as safe as possible. Use LFP when it's at your home. With this in mind, this of course leaves a whole range of EV packs that I personally wouldn't use. I mean, unless it was the new Cybertruck battery with its 800 volts. Hmm. Let me know your thoughts. Are these good reasons? Would you have different reasons? Do the benefits outweigh the risks for you? I look forward to reading your comments. Don't forget, like and subscribe and all of that. Battery man out. What is this battery project he's on about? I better click through to this video and watch it. And while I'm at it, like, subscribe, comment, share this video with my friends so that all the people that need to know about EV batteries, how many there are, what their uses could be in the future, can find out.